SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the lands of the Blackfoot people and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and we pay respect to their past, present, and future cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. SACPA commits to assist reconciliation efforts by raising awareness of the ways past and present injustices can be reconciled. So today we'll have a speak, speaker speak on freedom of speech. This book just came out by uh, Hassan and Rushdie. In 2022, he got up to speak about freedom of speech and he was nine. So I warn you all, we have people in here, anybody stands up and starts coming towards the speaker, they'll be wrestled to the ground. So. so our speaker today is Dr. Susan Dillon from the Department of Philosophy at the University of Lethbridge, speaking on freedom of speech. Please join me in welcoming our speaker. Good afternoon, folks. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for the invitation from Knut. Uh, this is my first time here. I'm relatively new to Lethbridge, so I will expect the you know, welcome, hopefully, that I've come to expect from Lethbridge, which has been warm, welcoming. I really enjoyed the few months that I've been here so far. So as noted, I'll be talking today about freedom of speech or freedom of expression, which I will generally be using interchangeably um, in my talk. And I'll be asking the question, why place limits on freedom of speech or freedom of expression? So I'm not going to, somebody asked me just before the talk which side I was going to come down on. And I'm not going to come down on either side of this question, but what I want to do is introduce to you some of the arguments on either side of the debate for why it is that we shouldn't place limits on free speech and why it is that we should place limits on free speech. As a philosopher, this is, these are the sorts of questions that I'm interested in. What are the principles um, that are functioning? What are the assumptions that are functioning behind these sorts of questions and in the background of these sorts of debates? So what I'd like to do is start just by looking at some of the legal context here in Canada. As I'm sure you're aware, freedom of speech or freedom of expression is guaranteed in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And so you can see it specifically highlighted in the green text there. So listed in the charter are fundamental freedoms, including freedom of thought, belief, opinion, and expression, including freedom of the press and other media of communication. Right, so here we see in the charter the guarantee of free speech or the right to freedom of expression. And so one of the things that I'll be looking at in this talk and what I'll look at first are, well, what are the arguments that support freedom of expression? What sort of assumptions are functioning in the background there? However, we also see in the charter the part that's highlighted in sort of red or orange, whatever the color looks like to you, that the Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees the rights and freedoms set out, such as free speech or freedom of expression, subject, however, in certain cases to reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. So that's gonna be the second part of my presentation. We're gonna look at arguments for why we might want to place limits on some speech, on some expression. So I'll be looking at the background arguments, the arguments that are used to defend freedom of expression and not place limits on freedom of expression, and then arguments that suggest, well, in some cases, maybe we should actually limit free speech. There might be good reasons for doing that. So that's my plan for the talk, to look at the arguments on either side. So if we want to see, first off, what are the arguments in support of freedom of expression, I think the uh, little blurb that was sent around introducing the talk for today captures some of the very key arguments that are present when people defend freedom of expression. And so in the blurb, there was a, uh, a little piece quoted from an opinion of the Supreme Court of Canada where they say the purpose of protecting freedom of expression is to enable, one, the pursuit of truth, two, participation in the community, and three, individual self-fulfillment and human flourishing. 
And you see these same three things identified in many opinions that the Supreme Court of Canada has handed down. In fact, other Supreme Courts as well have identified these three arguments. And they are picking out three specific arguments for why we think freedom of expression or free speech is important. And so I've tried to color code them for you there. One is what we can call the epistemic argument, which is the part where they reference the pursuit of truth. So epistemic has to do with knowledge, the pursuit of true belief, those sorts of things. So epistemology, which is one of the areas that I work in, is the study of knowledge. So there is an epistemic argument having to do with knowledge that's captured in the first part of that quote. There are political arguments in support of free speech or freedom of expression as well, generally having to do with how we protect our democratic institutions and decision-making procedures. So there is a political argument that can be offered for freedom of speech. And there's also a moral argument that's captured in that last part of the passage, individual self-fulfillment and human flourishing, where the idea is that we protect free speech because that is how people, individual people's right or ability to pursue their own conception of what it means to be a good life, to live a good life, is protected. So these are the three kinds of arguments that are presented in most of the opinions of the Supreme Court that you see having to do with freedom of expression. So I'll say a little bit more about each of those three arguments to make sure that we understand how they function. So the first kind of argument that we see the courts referring to are epistemic arguments. And so what these arguments suggest is that there are epistemic benefits, epistemic goods, that are achieved only if we protect people's ability to express their opinions. Right, so as I suggest on the slide, there are some arguments supporting freedom of expression that appeal to the epistemic benefits that we're thought to achieve if everyone is free to express their opinions. Now this is a kind of argument, so it's an epistemic argument, but it falls into the category of what we would call a consequentialist argument, because it's referring to the good consequences of protecting free speech. So it suggests that we should do something like protect free speech because there are good consequences that follow if we do. So for the epistemic, argument, we've got a consequentialist argument that says there are good epistemic consequences that follow if we protect free speech. And the idea here, and it's most famously forwarded by John Stuart Mill, if anybody is familiar with the name John Stuart Mill, he offers probably the most well-known epistemic <laughs> argument in favor of protecting free speech. And he argues that knowledge understood as a, having true beliefs is a public good, right? It benefits everybody if we have more true beliefs in circulation than we do have false beliefs in circulation, right? Which I think is a fairly intuitive idea. I saw a couple of people smile when I mentioned it's better to have true beliefs than false beliefs. And according to Mill, according to this argument, we are more likely to hold true beliefs as a group, as a community, if we permit people to express their ideas. Because in that way, if the belief I hold is true, and I have the freedom or the right to express that idea, then you get to hear my true beliefs. And that's a good thing, because then you can adopt them for yourself. But even, Mill thinks, if the belief that I have is false, it's a good idea if I can still express that belief, right? I need to have the right to express that idea because that allows you to remember why my belief is false and yours is true, right? So you test your true beliefs. You have to put them to the test of false beliefs, put them in dialogue with each other so that you remember, here are the reasons why I think this belief is true instead of just holding on to it as a matter of opinion or mere dogma or something like that. So all beliefs, whether they're true or false, need to be expressed. And if we protect that right or that freedom of people to express their beliefs, then we are more likely as a community to hold true beliefs. And we all agree it's better to hold true beliefs than false beliefs, so we should protect free speech. 
And that's generally how the epistemic argument for why we should protect free speech functions. We need to put all the beliefs out there on the table. You've likely heard of the idea of a marketplace of ideas, which is not Mill's phrasing, but captures really well what John Stuart Mill thinks the importance of free speech is. Put the ideas to the test. So that's one of the kinds of arguments supporting very broad protections of free speech or against limiting free speech. Another kind of argument, as I suggested, is the political argument, right? So there are some arguments that suggest there are political benefits to ensuring that free speech is protected. So only if free speech is protected, that people have a right to express their ideas, will we get these good benefits. So again, this is another consequentialist argument. The reason we protect free speech is because there are political benefits that we gain if free speech is protected. And what are those political benefits? Well, arguably, and folks have made the argument that, well, democracy works best if you're functioning in a marketplace of ideas. And authorit authoritarian forms of government are more easily avoided if people are allowed to express their opinions. And what we're specifically interested in protecting here is going to be the freedom that people will have to criticize and challenge political leaders, political decisions, political institutions. Right? Without that ability, right? without the ability to um, criticize the government, criticize leaders, challenge the decisions that they've made, right, you're more likely to end up with an authoritarian form of government than a democratic form of government. That tends to be something that we want to avoid, and so how do we avoid it? Make sure you protect people's right to criticize the government. And so that's one version at least of the political argument for why we should protect free speech. People need to be able to criticize the government and this is how progress actually occurs. This is how we secure our democracy and achieve moral, political, social progress. So that's the political argument in a, in a <laughs> thumbnail sketch anyway. These can get a lot more complicated but I'm giving you the, the thumbnail sketch of each of these arguments. And then there's also moral arguments for why we should protect free speech. So some arguments that support freedom of expression or are against limiting free speech appeal to the moral goods that we secure if everyone is able to express their opinions, right? if everybody has their freedom of expression protected. Now this is a bit of a different kind of argument. Typically, this is understood as what's called a non-consequentialist argument. It isn't appealing to the good consequences that follow from protecting free speech, but rather we appeal to this idea that there are moral goods of inherent value that are intrinsically good that freedom of speech protects. And so the moral good, the moral values that is protected by free speech is each individual person's autonomy or their ability to achieve fulfillment and to realize themselves, right? To flourish in a society. And the idea here is, well, people have the right to think for themselves, right? That's what it means to be autonomous or self-legislating, to make their own decisions, to live the kind of life they want to live. And that is only possible insofar as people are able to express their ideas of what they think the good life looks like. So it isn't about the good consequences that follow for society if we protect free speech, but about some, some moral value that you as an individual possess that needs to be protected through allowing you to develop your own opinions and to express those opinions to other people. So, We've got three different kinds of arguments that are used to defend the protection of free speech rights, which are often cited, all three of them together, in the opinions of, for example, the Supreme Court of Canada when deciding on cases about free speech. However, and I'm sure folks are aware that there is debate about what the limits on free speech should be, if there should be any at all. And so I also want to look at the arguments that are presented 
in opposition to those three arguments that I just provided for you. Because remember, in the charter, there's a suggestion that, well, you can place limits on these rights if there's good reason to do so and that it can be justified, right? Really roughly put. And so these arguments are suggesting, well, there might be good reasons to, in some cases, for some reasons, limit free speech or place limits on certain kinds of speech. And so depending on whether the argument that you are looking at is a consequentialist argument, like the epistemic and political arguments, or if it's a non-consequentialist argument, like the moral argument, the kind of argument you present in opposition to those arguments will look a little bit different. So if you're looking at a consequentialist argument that says there should not be limits on free speech, what the opposing argument would do is ask, well, are those epistemic benefits or political benefits, those good consequences, actually achieved when there are no restrictions on speech? Maybe it will be the case, according to these arguments, that limits on speech, of certain kinds of speech, actually do a better job of helping us achieve those consequences. Right? So with consequentialist arguments, it's an empirical question, right? What actually helps us achieve these consequences better? No limits on free speech or some limits on some speech, right? That's the question you ask with consequentialist arguments. With a non-consequentialist argument, you'll ask a bit of a different question. You will ask something like, do the moral values that free speech is supposed to protect actually exist? And moreover, are there other values that in some cases might be as or more important than those moral values that free speech is meant to protect? So I'll look a little bit at each of those three arguments again so we can see how somebody who might think there should be some limits on some speech would respond to the epistemic, the political, and the moral arguments. So, Remember, we looked at the epistemic argument, and the epistemic argument suggested that free speech should be protected and there should be no limits on free speech because free speech helps us achieve the public good of knowledge. Or we're more likely to have more true beliefs than false beliefs if free speech is protected or isn't limited. But you can ask questions. Is there actually any speech that gets in the way of achieving knowledge? Might it be the case that certain kinds of speech actually impede our ability to obtain true beliefs? And so there are folks who've suggested that, well, actually, if you place no limits on speech, this doesn't help us achieve knowledge. It gets in the way of achieving knowledge. So for example, and this is, perhaps a more recent development in this philosophical literature about free speech, false speech, some have argued, might actually, depending on its scale or its magnitude, get in the way of helping us achieve true belief or knowledge. So I imagine folks have heard about this phenomenon of fake news that's come about in the last few years. So you can ask questions like, well, does fake news actually get in the way of us achieving true beliefs. Because fake news seems to be functioning in a medium, on a scale, and at a magnitude much greater than, say, 20 years ago or something like that. So there are some questions about whether false speech is the sort of thing that should, have, should be limited. And of course, this is difficult, right? We're talking about background arguments and assumptions here. How this would look in practice is very, very challenging, right? But maybe, right, if the whole point of protecting free speech is because we want to achieve knowledge, then maybe speech that gets in the way of that should be limited in some way, somehow. Um, there's a longer history, I think, looking at how it might be that hate speech gets in the way of us achieving knowledge as a community, achieving true beliefs. And some of the arguments here suggest that what actually happens with hate speech is that hate speech silences certain people. And so people don't feel welcome or 
able to contribute to the conversation anymore because they are the target of hate speech. And what happens there is that if they're not contributing to the argument, if they're not contributing their ideas, <coughs> then their ideas are missing from that marketplace of ideas, right? So if hate speech silences people, and again, like I said, this is an empirical question, you can ask, well, does hate speech actually silence people? And if so, are we worse off because we don't get the expression of those ideas that we can test our own ideas against? So there are arguments that suggest things like false speech maybe should be limited if we're interested in the epistemic goods that free speech is supposed to provide for us. And same with hate speech. Maybe hate speech actually impedes our pursuit of knowledge, of obtaining true beliefs. Right, so those are some of the arguments that respond to this epistemic argument about freedom of expression. And you can get a similar response or set of arguments when it comes to the political arguments as well. Recall, political arguments in support of free speech or suggesting that we should protect free speech because there are political goods that result, namely, we strengthen our democracy and weaken authoritarian forms of government. That was the political argument in support of protecting free speech or against limiting free speech. But you can ask, is there some speech that actually impedes democratic functioning or strengthens authoritarianism? This is going to be, because it's a consequentialist argument, because it's a, an argument that asks are the effects we're hoping for actually achieved or not? This is the sort of thing you can go out and study. Right? If we limit certain kinds of speech, does that actually help democracy? If so, which kinds of speech? So again, you might be able to think of false speech. Maybe false speech or the phenomenon, again, of fake news actually gets in the way of democratic functioning and strengthens authoritarian functioning, and so we need to think carefully about whether and how something like fake news or false speech should be limited in certain cases, in certain ways, um, to a certain degree, those sorts of things. And you could also argue, right, hate speech might have um, a similar argument. Is it the case that hate speech, if we allow it to sort of be spoken freely because it's protected, actually encourages something other than democracy. So these are going to be reasons why we might want to think about how limits should be placed on speech if we're interested in what sorts of consequences free speech has for us. And then finally, there were the moral arguments. Remember, moral arguments suggest that there is some moral value that free speech sort of enables or protects. And specifically, the moral values that folks tend to look at are the values of autonomy. Autonomy is a good thing. We want people to be autonomous. The only way to do that is if people are free to express their ideas. And so that's how that moral argument for protecting free speech runs. But you can ask questions about this argument as well. However, this isn't a consequentialist argument. It's a non-consequentialist <laughs> argument, so it won't be about whether or not the consequences we hope for, hope for are achieved or not. But we can ask questions like, well, are there moral values that at least in some cases are more <laughs> important than the moral values that free speech is meant to protect or enable? So if free speech is meant to enable autonomy, for example, well, what about the moral values of equality or fairness or, right, you could think of other moral values to place sort of in that box where what we need to try to do is balance these moral values, <laughs> right? And so for this reason, this is why we actually do limit, for example, things like libel and defamation, right? Because it suggests that there are moral harms that are presented with libel and defamation, or various kinds of slander, right? So these are places where we limit freedom of expression because we acknowledge that the moral harms of these kinds of expression are too great. 
And you can think as well of hate speech, right? Is or are there certain moral values that we think are important that hate speech undermines? And the argument tends to be yes, right? So things like equality, fairness, justice, or the ideal of multiculturalism, those things are put under threat, so the argument goes, by hate speech, which is why, for example, or one of the reasons why in Canada, there are laws against certain kinds of hate speech. Right? So we've got, you can see, arguments that suggest we should protect hate speech, or not protect, protect free speech on the one hand, and responses as well to each of the different kinds of arguments that are leveraged to suggest that free speech is an important right that should be protected. Of course, things get complicated and they get complicated really quickly. I only have a few minutes left, so what I want to do is just identify some of those challenges. Um, so far, the arguments have been fairly abstract, but that makes sense because this is the kind of work I do. I'm a philosopher and I do abstract thinking. But putting any of this into practice is immensely difficult. And it becomes even more difficult when you think about some of the complicating factors. One of those complicating factors is where speech should actually be limited if it's going to be. Do we only limit public speech? Do we only limit, or do we never li limit private speech? And where do the lines between the public and the private actually exist? Because this gets really complicated in a few cases, such as social media sites. Social media sites where arguably the kinds of speech that present the most risk are the most prevalent, but social media sites are privately owned. Right? So the people who own the social media sites are the ones who get to say what kinds of speech is permitted and not. So social media sites are privately owned, they get to figure out what kind of speech is going to be permitted or not. And then what's really interesting in a problematic sort of way is that a lot of the speech that's actually prohibited on, for example, Facebook <laughs> is dealt with by moderators, typically paid very, very little. So they are exploited, right? And they get to see all of the bad stuff that shows up on social media so that we don't have to see it. So they are exploited and are subject to the most horrible speech that gets posted to social media. And so there's, very, there's a lot of complicated factors that go into considering how speech should be dealt with on social media. The same or a very similar challenge presents itself when we talk about university and college campuses because they exist in this sort of gray area between the public and the private. Right, where certain kinds of speech can be limited on these campuses where they might not be in what we call the public square, so out on the street or in front of City Hall. Um, and in those cases, freedom of speech also has to be balanced with the other goals that are present, such as achieving the goals of a liberal education, as well as ensuring academic freedom, right, which is another thing that free speech will have to be balanced with in those cases. So when it comes to actually thinking about how to limit free speech, because I'm thinking about the whys, when it comes to thinking about how to limit free speech, it gets a whole lot more complicated and very, very quickly. Um, and I just tacked it on to the end here to <laughs> demonstrate the immense difficulties in actually putting any of this into practice. But that's all I'm going to say for today. I thank you very much for the invitation again and for your attention, and I look forward to your questions. We thank the University of Lethbridge for their ongoing support, and we also thank the Lethbridge Herald and other media for their coverage and support. And we thank Rogers TV for recording our presentations and presenting them on Rogers TV. And we can also see uh, the previous talks on our website, sacpa.ca. So if you'd like to ask questions, could you please line up here behind Henning, who will be the first uh, questioner. Um, please state your name and your question briefly. No long preludes or stories, please. We expect respectful and polite discourse. If you prefer to write your question, you can hand it to me and I'll ask it on your behalf. <laughs> 
So, honey. Still, it's yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Move around. Good start. Hi, my name is Henning Mundell, and I have one question leading into another. Um, I know the Charter of Rights and Freedom we're talking in Canada, but I'm going to use the example of determining what is fake news south of the border. There's a gentleman with orange hair and face and so on who calls everything that goes against him fake news. So, is it the lawyers, the judges, ultimately the Supreme Court in Canada that decides whether fake news is there? And that leads me to my other question, to what extent do philosophers like you interact with the legal system? So, some nice easy questions right off the bat. Um, <laughs> Maybe I'll start with the second question first, if I can. Um, to what extent do philosophers like myself interact with the legal system? Um, I would say it depends on the philosopher. Um, <laughs> right, yeah, it's the right answer, right? Um, I myself don't directly, in part because I do, one of my areas is sort of philosophy of law. And so we think about questions like these, the abstract questions, the, the assumptions and background conditions and things like that. Um, I guess one way I indirectly interact is if I teach philosophy of law, which I often do. I haven't here yet, but I have before. Um, I am often tra training in the next generation of lawyers, right? Because there are a whole lot of students, especially in philosophy, which is really well known for producing the sorts of people who can think legalistically. Um, and who often want to become lawyers. So I'm often training the next generation of lawyers sort of indirectly. Um, but there's also, I would say, there are other philosophers more, much more directly engaged who will interact with lawyers in ways that I personally don't, or at least have not yet. Right? So in the future, hoping for more collaboration, just haven't done it yet. Um, when it comes to the fake news question, and I mean this is, in a certain sense, this is not a new phenomenon. <coughs> fake news has been around for a very, very, very long time. Um, I actually was teaching my students about this, about, I think it was a story from the 1930s about how the moon was populated by like reptilian <laughs> creatures, and everybody believed it, right? It ran as a news story and people didn't know, and so there was this, it was a hoax, the great moon hoax. And it, it's an early version of fake news, but I think fake news has, like I said, it's on a magnitude and a scale now that it wasn't before. And I think one of the things that folks like myself and other disciplines as well um, can do is to think really carefully about, okay, what does fake news mean? What distinguishes, there's discussions about fake news versus false news, because it seems to be distinguishable by the intent of the person who's using the term or offering the news. Um, so I think where it's a somewhat new phenomenon, at least at this scale, what we need to do first is, and this is one of the ways I think philosophers are helpful, is think really carefully about, well, what do we mean by fake news? What counts as fake news? What sort of criteria do we have to distinguish? And then those theoretical tools end up being useful when they're brought to courts or when they're brought to media companies who have to make these sorts of decisions. So you come up with the language and the distinctions and then hope that those become useful, which they often do. Like John Stuart Mill was a philosopher well, and a bunch of other things as well. Um, but the marketplace of ideas, which was not, not Mill's phrase, ends up being brought into the US legal system by Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, who uses the idea. Right, those are all of those ideas in the Supreme Court come to us from philosophical thinking. Hi, my name is uh, Tom Muffet, and uh, I'm just wondering. There's been some question lately uh, about what is a journalist, and I was wondering if you had given that uh, any thought. We have people saying that certain people are not journalists because they work for outlets that are biased, and other people saying they are. I mean, 
they have large followings, so and they post stories all the time, so they're journalists. So just uh, wanted to get your take on that. Thank you for your question, and I'll admit right off, I've never, if I have thought about it, it's only been very little or very tangentially, so I have not given careful thought to this. Um, I think one of the great things of like the internet is that people can express their ideas and share their ideas and get large followings and things like that. I don't think that is in itself a bad thing. Um, I think off the top of my head, I would like to think that somebody that sort of deserves the moniker journalist will adhere to journalistic ethics. And so I think whether or not somebody adheres to journalistic ethics might be, off the top of my head, and not having thought about this super carefully, a way to distinguish between journalists and other kinds of folks who create news for us. Whether or not there's a good term for those other folks, because they seem to occupy like perhaps some sort of a middle ground between simply a blogger or a personality and a journalist. Um, somebody else knows. Oh, here is what we call them. I'd love to hear that. But I think off the top of my head, that might be how I would try to parse that difference. Hi, my name is Terry Shillington, and thank you for a thoughtful presentation. I'd like you to uh, invite you to reflect about a dilemma going on in the States right now around what is hate speech. And um, it's been quite offensive to hear university students celebrating the atrocities that Hamas committed in, back in the of October. Um, and uh, as of whether, that, whether that's hate speech or not, it's quite offensive to have violent atrocities celebrated. Um, so I, I hear them uh, uh, debating what, what, where the bar is for hate speech, and, and I understand legally it's fairly high in the States. It has to be pretty atrocious to, to, to cross that line. Anyway, uh, it's pretty offensive speech, and how, do you, how, do you, how would you reflect on what that is, uh, where it fits in? So thanks again for the question. Um, I will mention, so I actually lived for the last five years in the United States. Um, and so I last was teaching this material in the context of the United States to um, American students. Um, and it's a very different context there, right? Teaching this sort of content to the United States versus Canada because the United States is the only sort of liberal democratic country that has zero laws about hate speech, right? So. In Canada, we have hate speech legislation, right? It's sort of um, identify, I don't have the language off the top of my head, but it's going to be speech targeting an identifiable group um, right, that causes harm to them, right? Very generally speaking. In the United States, there are no such laws. So I think it that very much changes the nature of the debate. Um, and this is where these arguments became, become especially poignant Right, because the, the argument for suggesting hate speech is the sort of thing that should be regulated has never been successful in the United States context. Right, so there's um, sort of one of the most famous cases is happened somewhat near where I was in Skokie, Illinois, where there was in a largely Jewish community, right, there was a neo-Nazi parade. Um, with, with the wearing the swastikas and everything, and this is one of the famous court cases where it turns out that the right for um, this parade to actually take place was protected under their free speech legislation, right? So two very, very different contexts. So in the United States context, anybody who's suggesting that, well, this is hate speech, you might say, yes, it's hate speech, but that doesn't mean anything legally in the United States, right? So it be, it's a very different sort of context. In the Canadian context, saying this amounts to hate speech means something, right? Whether it actually does or not is something that the courts would measure. In the United States, there is no such sort of measurement because there is no legal apparatus to identify something as hate speech in that context. And I think it's complicated, like I said, by the fact that there are university campuses which exist in this gray area between public and private I think it's complicated as well by the fact that 
college and university campuses are where these protests happen historically, right? If you think about the Vietnam War, right? This is where those protests were happening. This is where the police presence was. So I think there are lots of complicating factors there. Um, yeah, and I'll probably leave it at that. Mm -hmm. Hi, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm David Carpenter. Uh, my, my question revolves more on a kind of a real world situation, one we deal with here. Uh, a few months back in the newspaper, it was reported that prevailing thought is that another pandemic is coming. And most people would agree that that's, that's actually going to happen. Can't tell you when specifically, but I'm pretty confident that's the case. The government of Alberta decided they wanted it handled in a different fashion than the last pandemic. So they hired a politician, which I guess made some sense to somebody, to come up with the rules. And the rule now is that the next pandemic is going to be managed by a group which provides for alternate scientific facts. <laughs> <laughs> and then they fired the lady who is the public health officer. Uh, she had I guess some scientific knowledge too. <laughs> so what I'm wondering, when you talk about the public good, so this is real world stuff, the people who are going to be making the decisions are operating under a set of facts that many would suggest didn't go through the normal process of fact development that a lot of universities use. Um, do you think that's in the public good? <laughs> I'm not sure there is actually a question there to be answered, um, in the sense of it being less than rhetorical. Um, but. And this is a whole other area of philosophy that I study as well, um, known as sort of social and political epistemology, which has to do with how knowledge is actually produced um, and what the challenges are to producing knowledge and whether and how and when we should be relying on experts, what it is that makes somebody an expert. Um, but I think the alternative facts, alt facts, um, are certainly of a kind with fake news. And if we can say that, hey, these things do not actually serve the public interest, whether that's the knowledge or the political goods or so on, then we have questions about what sorts of speech should be permitted or who deserves to occupy certain positions. Um, but there's a lot in there. Happy to chat with you more about it later. Though. <laughs> 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 I won't have to go over quite as tall. Uh, my, my name is Terry Whitehead, and my question uh, for you is on this topic of freedom of expression, how it relates in the world of artistic expression and creative expression, and are there different rules or boundaries that society allows our artists? It's, I think the short answer is yes. <laughs> um, in, certain, in a certain sense, there are going to be different rules or exceptions carved out, right? Because um, certainly when it comes to, and th this I didn't mention at all in the talk, when it comes to, the word is escaping me right now, freedom of expression and, <laughs> it's always worst when this happens. The word is right there and, and I'm missing it. Um, obscenity, there we go, obscenity laws. Right, so this is a whole other category that I didn't even touch on. 
Um, but it's obscenity laws, which have a very long and complicated and really interesting history in Canada as well. Um, there are exceptions carved out for if what you might otherwise deem to be obscene has artistic merit, then it won't be considered obscene. Right, so this is another sort of sub area, I think, of freedom of expression that has to do with the artistic value of works or the artistic purpose of works. So certainly when it comes to obscenity, right, artistic expression is going to be carved out as an exception, sometimes problematically, right? There are interesting cases that are suggested there. Um, and I think when it comes to freedom of expression more broadly, again, it's, it would be a balancing act in a lot of cases where there will be sort of flexibility offered. Usually in the court system, there's gonna be flexibility offered that suggests, well, artistic merit might have a point, but only to a certain degree. And then it's sort of left for the courts to decide. Does that help? Yeah, just to follow up with kind of relation to satire. Yes. <laughs> and, and things like satire get tricky, um, especially, I think, in a world of alternative facts and fake news, um, whether you can just excuse them, well, it was just satire, right? So I think, I think it's a complicated question. <laughs> um, but I think something has to be fairly obviously satire for any exceptions to function, I think. Hi, thanks for the talk. Leona Jacobs is name. Um, I'm wondering if you can comment on how the marketplace of ideas actually can um, go through the process of development and exchange in today's modern world of technology. When the World Wide Web became the consumer version of the internet, um, in my profession, which is librarianship, um, we could, went, this isn't going to go well. And of course, now we have algorithms that are feeding based on clicks, yeah. the information. So to what extent are we actually compromising our whole freedom of expression, freedom of information, because of te technological change, as well as social change as well? So those two things. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. Yeah, I think the internet, broadly speaking, is interesting in the sense that when it first came out, I think people were really optimistic. Right, people are like, this is going to be the best thing ever for democracy, for the marketplace of ideas, because now anybody can put those ideas out there. We can hear from people in far-flung places that we wouldn't normally hear from. So it should, right, it should have, in theory, improved the marketplace of ideas because we are putting more goods into the circulation, right? Or more people were gonna enter into the marketplace. And then it seems that a lot of that, certainly a lot of that optimism has declined in part because so much of the internet is occupied by the social media companies and algorithms and increasingly folks are turning their attention to how AI right, might impact the marketplace of ideas. Um, but I think the marketplace of ideas itself was always a very idealistic sort of idea um, that probably was never fully realized in practice. Um, for various sorts of reasons, because some people speak more loudly than others, both literally and metaphorically, right? Some people have a larger platform than others. And so it's not an even marketplace where everybody has equal access to the market. So it was always, it's always been an ideal, and it was thought that freedom of expression would help us achieve that ideal, but I think in various sorts of ways we've seen how much more difficult that ideal is to achieve, especially with things like social media, um, and with algorithms, increasingly with AI and things like that as well. Um, and so whether, I think one of the new questions that results then is, well, how much have we completely, like how much has the ideal never been achievable? And this is only becoming sort of apparent to us now. Or is it possible to fix things so that we can more closely approximate that ideal? And I think there are gonna be people on either side of that, whether you're an optimist or a pessimist about the possibilities of technology, right? Can we actually change directions so that social media, Facebook, once again becomes a place where it actually improves democratic communication instead of making it worse? Because it seems, at least this is my impression, 
that has made it worse recently, the quality of our communication. Yeah. Thank you very much. You've really educated us quite a bit. Um, just from listening to you, I, oh, I'm Bev Mundell Atherstone. Um, from listening to your talk and your in, um, recent explanation that you have two, two problems of research, maybe my question relates to both. I'm wondering at what point do uh, racial slurs go from being acceptable to totally non acceptable to the point where you can actually lose your job if you use particular racial slurs. So is that, um, perhaps that's on your epistemological uh, side. Anyway, so if you can talk to racial slurs, because when I was a kid, growing up in California, you heard every imaginable racial slur, and I made the conscious decision never to use those, even in satire, never to use those terms. But I still hear them. And I'm wondering, where does that line fall? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like I keep saying this, but only because it's true, right? There are philosophers who spend their entire careers looking at slurs and what's wrong with them. I am not one of them, right? What's wrong with them? Um, can you ever use them? Who can use them? In what context can they use them? And so on and so on. So there is a great deal of literature actually looking specifically at those sorts of questions. Um, I think the distinction that I would make in response is the distinction between sort of legal limitations on free speech and moral limitations on free speech as well. Um, because the <coughs> legal restrictions are placing legal limits like hate speech legislation on certain kinds of speech is right the stronger version right because people can actually be punished in certain sorts of ways for using certain sorts of language um but i think partly what you were referring to is regardless of what the law says people might have a moral obligation to not use certain sorts of terms right and so i mean i think i would agree that it's immoral to use slurs whether the law tells me i can or not right and because that's a separate sort of discussion, but what, whatever the law says, I might think, well, it's immoral to use these terms. Why do I think they're immoral? Well, because I think they harm people, because I think they call up entire histories of degradation and dehumanization and subordination, right? I think there are lots of moral reasons which can overlap with the legal arguments but are often going to be distinct in the sense that, you, well, whatever the law says, I'm not gonna use that word, right? And so I think in a certain way, that's a decision for folks to make up their own minds about. Although if you were to ask me, I would engage in a discussion with you and I would say, here are the reasons why I think right, it's wrong, morally wrong, to use certain kinds of terms and language. But it's interesting because, and I also think that language evolves, right? There are things that are slurs now that were not slurs when I was a child. And there are things that, but that's partly through the learning process where we come to hear about the perspectives of other folks and realize, oh, maybe that's a term I shouldn't be using. It's because it's immoral. And then sometimes that ultimately travels out to legal considerations as well. Uh, Knut Peterson is my name. Uh, thanks very much for accepting the challenge to come to SACWA. Uh, my question, and it's not a plug for the university, although I love the university, uh, could you uh, tell us some good reasons why liberal education is important to teach kids uh, critical thinking, and, and how does that relate to today's topic? so much that I could say here. Um, but I think, and I hope, right, that some of the ideas that I presented here were sort of illuminating for you, right, gave you certain things to think about, certain things to talk about with your colleagues or your friends or, right, whoever it is, your family members that you might want to think about. And I mean, I hope that works for the students as well, right? 
so that students can understand, can think through why we do the things that we do, right? What are the arguments that are functioning or operating in the background? And then be able to chat about those things with their fellow students as well, right? So, and I mean, certainly in a philosophical classroom, pretty much any topic is up for debate, right? And what I always understand my job to be is partly to teach people the content, right? I'm partly going to teach you, well, what was Mill's argument about free speech, right? How did he argue? But what I want people to be able to do is develop the skills to think critically for themselves. And it's always interesting because um, sometimes I'll get student evaluations at the end of the course who suggest, well, she, really, she kept making us do this thing over and over and over again. And it's like, well, yes, because you're practicing a skill. And then I see them in another course, like you got really good at that skill without even knowing it. And the skill is careful reading, critical reading, asking questions, right? Which I always tell at the beginning of every class, I'm like, I'm not here to get give you answers, they may give you some, like this is what Mill said about free speech. I am training you to ask good questions. And I think that's what I do, I know that's what I do in my classes. And I think that's what a lot, if not all of my colleagues do as well. We're teaching students how to be critical thinkers and inquirers so that they can go out and live their lives not assuming everything is the way it's, ha not everything now is the way it has to be and that they can change things if they ask good questions and think critically about what the answers should be. And I think that's largely what a university education is for. It's teaching students how to think critically, engage with their society, and ideally to make it better. Yeah. My question will be, does the Charter of Rights protect the expression of freedom in children and adolescents? And especially like when my daughter was 16, she pierced her tongue and I was furious. How could she pierce her tongue with, how could they do that without permission from the parents? And I contacted the chief medical officer and she said that courts have ruled that the adolescents as young as 14 have the right to make decisions about their body. So now we have legislation that is, prevent, or that is preventing people to address children or adolescents that have chosen as their expression of, of uh, freedom or freedom of expression to use different pronouns. So, what are your what are your comments about that? Would that Supreme Court uh, rule on that that this is actually uh, preventing freedom of expression of children and adolescents? Yeah. Yeah. You're not asking easy questions today. <laughs> Maybe other other topics would get easier questions. Um, my impression off the top of my head would be to suggest that that would not fall under freedom of expression. Um, I don't think that's the relevant area of law to consider um, that because it's going to fall under um, like medical treatment um, and other things like that. So I don't think it's a freedom of expression issue. I think that's what the court, I think. Do not quote me on this. <laughs> but I think the courts would say this isn't a freedom of expression issue. This is something else, right? This is medical treatment, for example. Um, so I think that would be different. Um, the, I think the piercing is an interesting question because I had a very similar experience with my own parents coming home as a teenager with something pierced. Um, <laughs> but that was, and again, I think it might be, and there are certainly legal issues here, but I think moral and relationship issues here. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Before I ask you to give us a take home uh, message, I'll uh, announce next year's, uh, next year's, next week's speaker will be Sergeant uh, Ryan Darash from the Lethbridge, uh, Lethbridge Police Service and he'll be speaking on uh, the current status of the drug crisis in Lethbridge. Do you have a take home message for us? Wow, take home message. A take home message. I would say ask questions and think critically. It's, I, like I tell my students, I'm like, you're going to walk out of here with more questions than you came in, and if you do, I will consider my job having been well done. So if you walk out of here with more questions, then I say well done. Thank you so much for your time.